Now, uh, there's a guy named Mihail, uh, and I can't say his last name. I tried to practice it this morning again to get it down, but it's a very complex name. They consider him um, the, the godfather of flow state. He's the one who really started to pay attention and identify the qualities of flow. He, he, he came up with qualities to make it measurable um, so that we could measure it. He started to study it in the world. Then other people started to continue his work, you know, and, and, uh, and do, and like um, Stephen Kotler started to do a lot of work, Rise of Superman, you know, it's all about the flow state that he saw as a, uh, uh, as a writer in the uh, extreme sports industry, traveling around with all these extreme sports athletes and watching them. One of the things that Stephen Kotler said that was amazing to him was that he said uh, he'd, he'd break bones all the time and stuff like that out there with these extreme sports athletes trying to keep up with them because he wasn't as good as them. And he said, then I'd have to take like three or four or five months off and I would come back three or four or five months later and these guys were doing stuff that they thought was impossible three or four or five months late, earlier, and not only are they doing it, they were blowing that stuff out of the water. And he said it just kept happening. And he said at the rate we are growing right now, because we are accessing flow state in the world so much easier than we ever have before, uh, it's starting to, uh, it's starting to, it, it's just, everything is changing overnight. It's part of why. Um, he said like, they used to think for, for many, 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 long, many years since surfing was invented, they, or figured out, I shouldn't even say invented, um, they thought you could never ride above a 25-foot wave, he would say. And he said there were papers written on this about how it's impossible to ride, ride a surfboard on, 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 a, on a wave that's higher than 25 feet. And now we've got people riding 100-foot waves because of flow state, because they get into these flow states and their bodies can do things that they can't do if they were thinking. So that's how powerful flow state is. Also, flow state is very addictive for people that really start to love it and get into it. It's super addictive. So I want to talk about that anyways. His last name, I'll spell it for you guys. So what he did was he started to identify, and I want to talk about the basics of what he does, and then I want to talk about the basics of what we're looking at here at Fearless, and I want to give you practices that kind of integrate it all. Um, I had a client who was trying to enter into flow state a lot, and he was taking a course on flow state, and he said they had me getting up in the morning and doing all these push-ups and jumping up and down, and I just feel like that's not what it's really about. I mean, that's great. Like, if you're trying to enter into a real aggressive physical flow state, sure, but uh, you know, maybe I need to do that to, to get down and write a paper, but I think there's easier ways to do it, in my opinion. Also, flow state is really good for developing self-esteem. The more you can enter a flow state, the more you do these successful uh, activities, you start to do stuff that's way beyond your capability, the more you start to feel the pride in yourself, the courage, the that it took to do that, it all starts to happen naturally and it kind of builds your, uh, you, like you get this book of success that starts to happen. You don't have to do it with big things either. You don't need to ride a hundred foot wave. I mean, if you've never, if you've never been on a surfboard in your life, just getting on a surfboard and getting into a flow, just a basic flow riding in the whitewash could be enough to, to feel like, wow, I feel amazing today, right? And so that's what we're talking about. So. Approaching women, in my opinion, and socializing, not just approaching women, socializing, connecting with other people, letting the flow happen between you and another person is so powerful for your self-esteem. I think it really builds self-esteem, self-love, if you do it on a regular basis and you keep releasing all the garbage that comes up because it's gonna stir up the garbage, you know? All that, that the weeds, you're getting all the weeds out and, uh, and they're gonna come up every time I go to approach. Then I bust through into flow state a little bit, and then I can go back and release everything that came up from that process later, okay? Through the revealing process. And then that'll reveal more of your self-esteem. So, um, so let's look at flow triggers, individual. So these are individual flow triggers. There's group flow triggers and individual flow triggers. A group flow trigger might be like when I was at Burning Man and we were all felt like we were in one symbiotic unit all dancing together to this DJ and it's just, dum, da, da, dum, da, da, everybody's flowing together. Everybody have an experience like that? Yeah. Yeah. Ritual, you, too. yeah. Ritual, tribal, you know, things like that. Actually, the biggest group, not the biggest, but the, one of the best group flow straights I ever di did was with a Sufi Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Salik Schwartz, and he, uh, he came out to do a zikr with us, a, a chanting zikr, where we moved and danced in unison and chanted, that I felt like I was leaving my body. I felt like I was floating up and out of my, it was a crazy, it was a, it felt so tribal. 
And that, that shit was off the charts. And I had done some Sufi zikrs with another guy that wasn't a sheikh. He just kind of learned them and did them, and it wasn't even close to the same thing. When this guy led it, his energy just took us to a whole new place. And it was like, wow, that was crazy. So the thing, these are the triggers that he, and he identified to help put you into a flow state. And we're gonna, we're gonna take a look at these in, in, in terms of, re, uh, of, let's say, anything you might do and ultimately flirting and approaching women. Novelty, um, complexity, unpredictability, risk, passion, clear goals, immediate feedback, autonomy, yeah. Challenge, skill, balance, and creativity. Creativity, so that's autonomy, guys. Um, so he's, he says these are the things that'll pop you into flow state uh, as, on an individual level. Now, when I read this, I immediately resisted it. Why did I resist it? Why do you think I resisted it? This shit, to me, looks like it's gonna put me into my fucking head, okay? <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying there's not value in it. If I'm out there and I hit a flow state and I have back, backcountry snowboarding through trees, right? There's, is there novelty? Is there complexity? Is there unpredictability? Was there risk? Was there passion? Was there a clear goal? Was there immediate feedback? Yeah, hitting the fucking trees, immediate feedback. Um, <laughs> Autonomy, uh, challenge, skill, balance, you know, is, you, is the challenge and is it, is it, you know, it's, it's a balance between your challenge and your skill level. You got to have the right balance. Otherwise, if you, if the challenge is way better, way, way too hard for your skill level, you know, you're out or vice versa. If the skill level is uh, way above the challenge, you're not going to probably pop in. But I disagree with that, too. Uh, and the reason that is, is if I'm cruising down a mountain on my snowboard or skis and the challenge isn't very high, but I just start surrendering to uh, um, the flow, like carving and flowing, and I just kind of go into the now, I'm right in flow state. So it just, for some people, they need a lot of challenge to enter. I think for other people that are just used to meditating and surrendering, they don't need as much challenge. I mean, I can walk down the street and just drop in sometimes, okay? And creativity. Now, What's nice about this list is I can look back at it after I've done something. Like I can, I can, and then say, well, if I had trouble getting into flow, what was missing afterwards? And say, okay, so maybe I'll up that the next time. Let's say I go out to socializing one night and I go flirting and I had trouble getting into flow. And I can say, well, was there novelty, complexity? You know, what, what was missing? And maybe it's none of those. Maybe it's some of those. Uh, maybe. I mean, it could be as simple as I got negative feedback right away, which put me into a negative feedback loop. So I don't know where that would even fit on here, to be honest. Uh, but all, everything is there, novelty, complexity, to go into flow state. But it doesn't mean that I did, okay? So, um, so we're going to talk about, we're going to take a look at that. But, but to me, this is still a good list to have to look at what you're doing. All this, to me, equals what? If each one of these has an aspect of tension or vulnerability to it, doesn't it? Is that, you know, novelty is like moving in a new way. It's exploring the unknown. There's tension, there's vulnerability in, in moving in a new way. I could get embarrassed, I could fall down, I could get hurt. Complexity, right? Unpredictability, risk, passion, clear goals. Uh, like that's like focused right into the tension. Immediate feedback, you know, letting that feedback in without taking it personal, that's huge. You've got to let the feedback in completely and let it flow through your body and not, not say, oh, I, I get that, I understand that, I, I know how that works. Um, autonomy, you know, uh, the ability to, in my opinion, and when I look at that, is to be able to, you know, do, can I do it on my own? Do I constantly, do I need to be in, under complete, can I explore this behavior on my own, right? But some of this, to me, kind of all fits together like novelty, complexity, autonomy. So I just have a different view on this than other people do. Challenge, skill, balance. Was I in an environment where I felt challenged? Was I in an environment where I could work my skill set? You know, when I went out to flirt that night. Um, was there a good balance of ratio between the two? Creativity. Uh, but if I look at all this, is there tension in all of these? Is there vulnerability in all of these? To be creative, is there vulnerability? Yes. Uh, to deal with challenge has to do with tension, right? Autonomy has to do with uh, tension and possibly vulnerability. Oh shit, nobody's gonna tell me what to do, I gotta do this on my own. Immediate feedback, receiving the tension and the vulnerability of that. Clear goal, intention, and attention. This could be vulnerability or tension. 
This is definitely uh, tension and possibly vulnerability. They're, 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 tension and vulnerability are really two sides of the same coin. They're polarity. They're the same thing. So all of this works together within that. So I like to simplify it down to that a little bit. And then if you really want to go back and look at what's going on with you, you can look at this and get a better idea. Uh, now I want to quickly write down the uh, flow triggers for group. So, so you guys can see the whole thing and see what, see what he graphed out. Would a group be defined as two people? That's a good question. To me, I feel like it's three different I would say yes, if the two of you are in flow together, like you're feeling each other. That's the key, is, is there multiple people flowing together? Like am I dancing with a girl, uh, like a, a, a couple's dancing, and we're feeling each other, moving off each other? That's how I would look at it. But I'm not a, this is a, this is a different way than I look at it. So I'm kind of showing it to you guys from his perspective. Complete concentration. And just ask yourself in these, where's the tension? Where's the vulnerability? Uh, shared goals, shared risk. So if we're dancing together, is there a shared goal? Is there shared risk? Um, he likes to talk about yes and, and this is a, I actually think is very important. And I'll talk about this in a minute. Um, that's from the improv, yes and, by the way. Uh, close listening, autonomy, blending egos, familiarity. I screwed that up, didn't I? Equal participation and open communication. Now, how might I use this? Let's say I, I have a concert and I'm a DJ. I might go through this after each one of my concerts and say, how much of this did I offer to people within the, as the DJ to the group? Did I, did I give them... Uh, did I, did I create a, a contained environment where they could, have, they could all concentrate on, on the music and the dancing and they, they could all you know, be together? Did they have, do we have a shared goal in mind of surrender? And did we have a shared risk in mind, being vulnerable, dancing, jumping up and down, flowing? Was everybody agreeing to the environment? Yes, and, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, close listening, which is gonna be a very vulnerable thing. We're feeling each other, that's letting the energy in. Um, Autonomy, could somebody walk away if they wanted, right? Could they dance in their own way or to, and still be part of the group? It's, it's different from, from somebody else. Was there a sense of control? Well, yeah, they all had a sense of control within the environment. The environment was controlled in a sense. And again, that goes back to the container. Blending of egos, uh, familiarity, you can see it's all there. But to me, again, there's a lot of overlap here. Um, yes and is really interesting because how do we get, a lot of people get addicted to improv, right? When they go out to do improv, they want to do more improv and they really have a lot of fun with it. And you get a big group of 10 people together and they'll, they'll create a whole skit together. And they start, it's fun, right? And it's all in the moment. They're all just making it up as they go. This, is, this moves you into kind of a flow state. How do they do it? What's the, what's the key element? And the key element is yes and. And this is one of the things that is so powerful in your thinking or your mindset when you're moving into flow state. And I do agree with that. It's instead of saying no to something, you say yes to something and you add more to it no matter what the other person says. This is something they do in improv. So when they say, oh, I see a purple, uh, a purple elephant uh, named Bernie. No, they're just, I just, check out my new purple elephant named Bernie. He's fucking awesome, isn't he? You as one of the 10, if it's your job to come up and start talking, your job is never to say no to that. You'll kill it. You kill the energy immediately. You say yes. Yes, I see Bernie. Bernie's fucking cool. You know what? I'm going to paint Bernie gold. I think Bernie gold is much better. I think he's much happier with the color gold. You see, you said yes to it and you added more to it. And then the next person adds more and the energy keeps flowing and it, keeps a, it starts to build a flow state because we're all building off each other, which also validates each other. And this is one of, the, uh, one of the things you can use when you're socializing. Just use the yes and mindset. It's so powerful in socializing. You can even say yes and then change the topic and move it in a new direction. You can even say yes to people that are trying to insult you or attack you or guys that are trying to be a dick to you or women that are trying to be mean to you. The, that principle is so powerful. So if a woman comes up to you and says something like, you know, oh, why are you bothering my friend? Instead of saying, oh, no, no, I'm not bothering your friend, which you feel that drop of energy, you say, yeah, I'm super annoying. I'm glad you noticed. Man, you're a good friend. Do you see how you just sank with the resistance? You say, I wish I had a friend like you. And then, yeah, I'm such a loner, whatever. And then she, it takes away her power. 
Do you see what I'm talking about? So that yes and makes everybody smile. It makes them open, open up. And we used to practice yes ands a lot back in the day. Uh, we just practice saying stuff to each other and say yes anding each other back and forth and trying to get each other and see if we can get the other person to fuck up their yes and. And it's a lot of fun because it makes you think on the fly. It teaches you to flow. It teaches you to go towards a flow state. Because to be good at it, you can't be thinking. You have to be thinking with your gut brain. You have to be feeling. So thinking on the fly isn't even really, it's, that's even not correct, okay? And then what happens is when the flow starts to happen, I think this one's very important here, you start to create, and this is what's so important about flirting, this one. You start to get a blending of an ego. Your egos start to blend together. You start to get each other, right? From the yes and. That also forces close listening. Do you see what I mean? And then you, together you have shared risk and all just kind of clicks on. I think this one is, it really starts to facilitate a lot of this. It creates familiarity as you get to know each other. Everything starts to build off of that. Can you guys see that? Yeah. So blending of egos would be like uh, letting go of rigid beliefs to kind of adopt the other person's belief. I, I'm a little confused though what a blended ego would be. It's like, I think your ego starts to relate to each other. They start to speak a common language. That's how I see it. You know, there's a sense that me and you think the same. Okay. So we're, so our ego, so we're becoming, we're, we're opening up to each other and being vulnerable. To, so our egos are becoming vulnerable to each other would be another way to look at it. Okay. And feeling safe together um, versus fighting each other. So these were the, these are the 20 things that this guy identified that put, that in his mind, that can put us into flow state. Now, how can we make this easier? Because it is kind of a complex idea and it's a lot to think about, right? And there's nothing wrong with using these things. Uh, I would say in hindsight, you go out and you, you do a bunch of flirting in a bar and then you go back and you say, especially this group flow trigger, and kind of run through and say, wow, I didn't hit flow state tonight, or even a little flow state, was any of this missing? And then say, next time we'll fix that. I don't believe in going, if you go out right before you go into the bar and you say, okay, I need to make sure I have all these in place, it's gonna put you in your head. And that's the antithesis of flow state, so you don't wanna do that. Um, one of my friends once said that when you're out flirting, if you really wanna be good with women, and this was Jason, the guy I talked about earlier, uh, Jason Savage, he said, you don't want to be thinking. That's the worst time to think. He says, you just go. You set an intention and you go. I don't think he said set an intention, but that's how I look at it. And you go, like he did, hey, come here, come here, come here. And you just start going and you go into flow. After you're done, the end of the night, the next day, you can analyze what you did and say, what could I do better next time? Take note of it, write it down, put it in your journal. But when it's game time, you don't think. That's why at Fearless, we often say, guys, this is really important, there's practice time and there's game time. Practice time and game time. Practice time, I'm going out today and I'm gonna to talk to 100 people, not necessarily beautiful women, everybody, and I'm gonna work on eye contact or I'm gonna work on opening my heart to each person. I'm gonna work on, I'm gonna set one thing and I'm gonna work for the next five interactions, I'm gonna work on that one thing. Next 10 interactions, I'm gonna work on this other thing. I'm just looking for these little one percenters I'm gonna work on. And then when, it's, when I see a girl I really like, I'm just gonna drop it all and my intention is to go over and flow with her, right? So if you look at, a professional sports team, let's say a professional NFL team, how much time do they spend practicing so they can surrender when they play? Okay, so they're both elements are there, but when it's game time, when you're actually f having fun, don't sit there and stop and go back and analyze this. Think about what you have to do. Pick one thing. Maybe you need to work on one of these skill sets. You can go out and do that. You can say, you know what? I need to work on close listening a lot. That's one I'm, I'm not good at. So I'm gonna go out today, I'm gonna talk to 10 people and really listen to them. You know what? I'm gonna work on, I, I really feel like I need to create a sense of shared risk together. How could I do that? What would that look like? Maybe I can, maybe I can start to say stuff like, uh, I'll start to do a yes and set where I start to pull her into it so she's having to be part of the character. She's taking risks like me. Like I'll talk about the, the golden painted elephant, and I'll be like, oh, it's so much fun to ride the golden painted elephant. You know what, I'm gonna stick you on the back in a bikini, and you're gonna, you're gonna hold on to me, you're, you know, and, you're gonna, and you're gonna be my cheerleader while we race, you know, when the elephant races, whatever. 
You see what I mean? And now she's part of it too. She's like, oh my God, I wouldn't do that. And I'm like, no, we're gonna put you in a bikini just like uh, Princess Leia in Star Wars. It'll be super sexy. You know that, that one with the swirly boobs? And she'll laugh and now she's feeling, instead of you entertaining her, you're both taking a shared risk. You're playing together. That would be an example, okay? But you can go through this, look at this, and stuff like that. But I want to present another idea, other ways to look at it, but I did want to present this idea to you so you guys have it. Now, I want to ask you guys, as I go through this, who already feels the tension of all of this and they're going up into your head and you feel that pull up your head? That's what we want to avoid. That's why I'm not a big fan of this. But I want to give it to you so you can see it because he's supposed to be the expert, okay? And he is, he knows a lot about this stuff. And there's lots been built off this, okay? A lot of programs have been built off it. The other ways to get into flow, we're gonna, we're gonna look at, we're gonna make it really simple. We're gonna be looking at the idea of tension, vulnerability, the conduit, and the, uh, the center pillar here, which is what the conduit leads to. And we're gonna work on, work on feeling that, exactly what Daniel talked about that put him into flow for three weeks straight. But don't think about it anymore from this point forward. Okay, just let it go. Drop it and, let, and let's let something new reveal itself to you. Okay, now a couple of key elements that I want to bring in is, have you guys ever heard the term that it's 10,000 ma- uh, uh, 10, hours to mastery of anything? How many, has anybody here ever experienced something different? Did you ever learn something really fast, insanely yeah. fast? What was that? Um. Energy stuff, to be honest. Okay. Anytime I'm in some sort of energetic learning, it just comes to me. How much? How much did you love it? That, yeah, it's a very pleasurable thing, so it's easy. Yeah. Were you in flow state when you were learning it? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, what they say is that that ten thousand hours gets cut in half when you're learning from flow state. So five thousand hours to mastery, and so. If I wanted to learn anything, the question I would ask myself is how can I get into flow state while learning this? Even just a little bit. Even just a little bit. So most people, two, well, I'll give you an example. Two days a week in flow state makes you a, th- a thousand times more productive than everybody else around you that's not in flow state. So they, it goes up by 500% each day. So you can literally start cutting that time way down. Two days a week in flow state moves your productivity up a thousand percent. And only 5% of the population gets into flow state on average, on a regular basis. Now everybody's experienced it to some degree, doing something, but only 5% of the population gets into flow state on a regular basis. Who here has done a lot of approaching of women? Okay. Yeah. And how much of that time was spent in flow state, do you think, going out and approaching women you've never met? I have a lot of resistance to approaching unless I'm into the chick, so yeah. it's probably not, not as much as it should be. But yeah, and that's, what, that's why approaching has never become fun for you. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if you could do approaching in flow state, even mild flow state, highs, stops, flow state, what's the odds it would start to become fun for you? Possibly addictive. Okay. That's what I'm talking about. So, it says cuts by 50%. Most people are in flow about 5% of the time. Actually, most people get into flow about 5% of the time. People in flow state are five times more productive. Two days a week in flow is 1,000% more productive. And we're gonna get into the, uh, the neurochemicals of flow, but there's all kinds of neurochemicals that come out when you're in flow state that are, that are really good for the body. And so we'll get into that in a second. But when you look at this, And I think about the most successful, and I'm gonna use billionaires in the world. When you think about the most successful billionaires in the world, they all have something in common. The Warren Buffetts, uh, you know, the Elon Musks, you could say anybody that's that's self-made, really successful, they go into flow state when they're working their job. They love to work, they all say that. They can't wait to get to work and do their thing and spend all day. Warren Buffett's constantly studying the markets and everything, right? He loves it, right? Donald Trump talks about how he loves to work. Elon Musk, does Elon Musk seem to love what he does? Building Tesla. So there, do you, what do you think the odds are that these guys are entering into flow state and going through every day they go to work? 
So when you see this, two days a week in flow state is a thousand percent more productive. When you look at guys like this, how many days a week are they in flow state? Yeah. Six. Do you see why they're so wildly successful? How about Jordan? How much was Jordan probably hitting flow states? He was forcing himself in because he was a cocky motherfucker, but whenever he had that basketball, that was his fucking domain. That's probably why he loved the sport so much. It probably took him out of, you know? So can you picture how productive, why, why he became the best, one of the best basketball, if not the best basketball player in the world? Now well, let's talk about guys that get really good at meeting women. I was talking about my friend Savage today. Probably one of the best I've ever seen in the field. Just blew, blew my mind away, the stuff he could do. Why was he like that? Notice when I described him earlier, he would enter right into flow state the moment he got out to a bar or a club. He would start with that rocking, right? And so for him, and he lived in a van and his whole life was stopping to pick up girls in every city he drove to. He'd go find somebody to hang out with and, and he'd just spend it, he'd do it all day long. So he's a thousand percent more productive two days a week, so how, again, with socializing with girls, if he's doing it all the time, making it his full-time job, and he has, and he's addicted to it because of flow state, what's happening? Self-reinforcing. Yeah, you can't not do it again the next day. He loves it, right? Some people get that way with meditation. Right? They go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. So, anything you want to learn, the more you can cultivate this state even just a little bit, is going to increase your ability to exponentially learn it really fast. I would argue that language learners that are polyglots go into flow state when they're learning languages. You know, that they get hit these mini flow states or big flow states and they can probably, they, they probably love it. They're probably absolutely addicted to it. Now there's a guy named George Washington Carver, a book called The Man Who Talks With Flowers. Glenn Clark wrote that book about his life too. Anybody know who George Washington Carver is? Yeah, he, he lived in the uh, late 1800s into early 1900s in the South, okay? And he came out, he was born right at the end of slavery or right at the tail end they came out of slavery. I'm not, I can't remember exactly when. And then he ended up uh, growing up in the South and living on this farm, not, not farm, excuse me, at a college. And he taught at the college, it was a black college, and he taught there his whole life. Very giving, loving man. He's famous for the peanut. If anybody's ever heard of that, he figured out all the uses when the, when, when the South didn't have any crops and they needed money and the only crop they could produce was the peanut at that time. He said, no, no big deal. I'll figure, out use, I'll figure out what to do with the peanut because they're like, what are we going to do with all these peanuts? So he figured out, I forgot how many uses for the peanut. He just sat down with the peanut and figured it all out. And then it saved the whole industry in the South. And people wanted to employ him. They offered him huge amounts of money to come work for him because he was so brilliant. He turned them all down, just wanted to work in the college. He had his healing clinic. He loved flowers, so he'd spend a lot of time out in the forest figuring out medicinal uses for flowers and how he could use them in the healing clinic and to help people. And somebody once asked him and said, how did you figure out all these medicinal uses for flowers? And I remember the day I read this in the book. I read it and it said, and when the person asked him that, he said, well, it's easy. You love the flower so much it reveals all its secrets. And I thought to myself, okay, that sounds meta, st you know, stupid to me. That sounds metaphysical or metaphorical. What do you, how, what's the real steps? Y years later, I reread that and I was like, holy fuck, he just said it literally. Literally, he gets so completely in love with this flower that he gets nothing but revelations and the flower begins to reveal all its secrets, revealing. The more you love it, anything, like if you love a foreign language, What's the odds you're, the more you're going to go into flow state and start learning it really fast? If you love surfing, what's the odds you're going to go into flow state and start learning, you're learning it really fast? You're going to become really good overnight. We had a coach that used to work for us, and he became an amazing guitar player in a short number of years, uh, Matt. And, uh, but he said I couldn't put it down. I just, I would sit and my mom would take it away from me at night, so I'd go to sleep and I'd, I'd sneak and get it and I'd be in the bathroom going ding, 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 all night long just playing with this guitar. I couldn't put it down. And the guitar revealed all its secrets to him. Do you see what I'm talking about? And so anything you fall in love with, your brain is going to start to just come up with ideas and realizations and revelations and pictures and images and all these downloads are going to come to you. 
And that's exactly what Walter Russell said. That's how he said he learned everything. Remember how I said he learned, he did that statue of Edison overnight, a bust of Edison? He said all he did was he meditated all night and, and, let his, and opened his heart to the idea and fell in love with the idea until all the realizations came to him how to do it. Now, whether that's how it literally happened or not, I don't know, but it's very interesting. And he says that's how he pretty much learned everything. I've seen it a lot with this work. I've come up with ways to help you guys just by meditating and saying like, I'm gonna meditate on Sean today. What does Sean need? Show me, show me. And I just sit with the idea, determined to get the answer and then just surrendering constantly until suddenly realization comes, okay, do this with Sean tomorrow. Okay, I'm gonna go do that with Sean. I don't know why. And then boom, you see the answer. You see why when you go do it. And that's surrendering to more in a sense, love, cap, higher energies starts to move you in that direction, okay? And so we're gonna show, now I love, now this stuff all sounds really cool, but we gotta show you literally what's going on now when you do that. And that's the part where it gets really interesting. So we're gonna get into that. Okay, what do I mean? What to me is flow state? What, is, what do I do different than everybody else? Who here has done the heart walk? Okay, who here has done a vulnerability walk? Okay. They're two different things to me. Those are just names that popped into my head. For, I'm trying to literally label what's, what's happening. That's all I was trying to do. Um, so he said, fall in love with it. Okay. If I am to fall in love with something, I, essentially I have to let it in to my body. I has to touch my heart, right? So I literally have to let it in, not metaphorically, literally. I have to let the feeling of it in because otherwise it's not, I'm not going to get vulnerable with it. If I don't let something in, how can I get vulnerable with it? How can I get realizations about it? How can I learn about it? If it, I don't let it into this machine, which everything, all the realizations come through. It's like, if I don't download the thing into the computer, I can't, I can't uh, learn about it. If I don't download the document, the PDF, it has to come in first. Okay, so that's the number one thing. So the heart walk is all about letting stuff in. So this is something I started to practice a while ago. I started to walk around and I just started to get up in the morning. And I can't remember exactly why I did this, but I started to look at things and I create a conduit. Now, the conduit was very interesting because through years of practice with men and women gazing, I started to see that there's a conduit that happens and you can control that conduit. Matter of fact, my conduit used to be very blown out. My teacher showed it to me and we didn't call it the conduit at the time, but we would gaze and everybody would say, Brian, you look stoned, you look gone. And so I would look at you and I'd be like this all the time. Hey, how you doing? And they're like, Brian, what's wrong with you? Nothing, what do you mean? So what am I doing when I do this? Hey, how you doing? Yeah, yeah it's hard to reach me, isn't it? So you, you literally can't get my energy from me or into me. So you, because what did I do? I, I literally, yes. So if I have a camera lens, I widened it so far that it became a little blurry. And what does that do for me? What does, that, what does that do for my, for, for my ego? How does, that, well, how does that benefit me? Perceived benefit, huh? It's a shield. It's, yeah, it keeps me from feeling you, all your emotions. You see, I went through a lot of abuse as a child. I went through a, a very emotionally abusive household. So I learned to just numb out and not let anything get through the numbness, okay? And I've seen other people come the opposite. I've seen had students come to me where they're just like, their eyeballs look like they're going to pop out and they're trying to fix everything all the time. <laughs> hey, what do you need? Let me get that for you, you know, and they're running around like that. I was this, okay? So I had a teacher that would go in with me and then go out with me. And he would stare at me, go in. And the contrast, he'd hold it and then he'd go out. I was like, oh, I see what you're doing. And he says, you're blown out. And I'm like, I am? So I started working on, can I focus in a little more? And as I did, I realized, oh, wait a minute. What is this? Over time, it didn't happen right away, over years of work, I'm creating a conduit. There's a sense of flow between me and you. A conduit is like a wire, it's like a hose, it's a, it's a channel for, for the flow of something. So as I narrow the conduit, it gets more intense. As I widen the conduit, it gets looser. As I go really wide, it gets wider. I started to notice that. And I said, interesting, so there's a conduit. And then at first I started thinking, oh, if I wanna to talk to a girl, I gotta like, oh, create a conduit right to her and send her energy, hey, what's up? But then I realized that can be too much sometimes. I said, what if I relax the conduit a little wider and then maybe I poke at her, say, hey, what's up? And then I relax the conduit and let her in. And then I said, oh, wait a minute, if I let her in, can I let her go down to my heart? 
Can I let her go down to my stomach? Can I ground her all the way down? I said, I can. I started to feel all this, right? Could you feel me doing that? Yeah. What was that like? Yeah, and notice when I first came at you, I poked at you, and that's when you smiled. I was like, hey, what's up? And I pushed, and then I switched the polarity. I went from this direction to this direction. And I, so I was running energy this way down the conduit, now I'm running energy this way down the conduit. Do you feel that difference? I feel it. And so I can literally switch that polarity. So if I'm looking at you, Jeremy, and I create a conduit, I'm like, hey, what's up? Now I'm pushing on you just a little bit. I'm challenging you. This could be a cocky, funny, it could be in a bar, like, hey, what's up, what's your name, right? But then I start to go relax and I start to let you in. Now I can be curious about you. I can let you into my heart, ultimately, and say, what am I learning about you from my heart? I can let you down in my stomach and let my, the energy from my heart drop into my stomach and teach me. Interesting. And do you feel me do that? Do you feel that switch of direction? Mm -hmm. That's what I want you guys to get. I control that with the conduit. So what happens when people get stuck in their head? They usually get bound up here, too much thinking, and they tighten up here and they pull out of the heart, okay? And then they can't do the heart walks because this is bound and this is bound. And so they're walking around going, I'm gonna feel that. And even if they try to open here, but if they're bound here, it's just like this. And the energy's not getting past here. It's gotta go down the front. So if I look at you and I poke, hey, what's up? That's a poke, right? It's a challenge. Now if I let you in, start opening my heart, it gets softer, doesn't it? And then I let, it, let you start letting you down farther and farther, okay? Same basic idea. If I look at you and I'm like, hey, what's up? And I'm challenging you a little bit, then I start to let you in, then I let you in deeper. Now I'm like, hey, what's up? Do you feel the difference? Do you feel that energy flow into me? Okay, good. This is one of the things that women, that, that pickup artists try to do with banter and humor. I'm gonna come tease, poke, bam, 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 then I'm gonna get vulnerable. Oh, tell me more about you. Oh, you're so interested, and boom. They're doing it analytically, but they, they gotta also do it physically, which they don't understand is going on in the background. Like I can go up and say, hey, you look like trouble. Oh my God, you're such fucking trouble. And that's pushing, right? But then I, then I go, oh, wow, you, you went through a lot as a child. Tell me more about that. And I'm supposed to care. But if I'm actually pushing while I'm saying the opposite, see, it doesn't make sense. It's incongruent. So you got it. The energy internally has to match what you're saying. And that's where a lot of pickup artists get, in, they call it incongruent, right? And so for you guys, if I'm poking, I'm like, hey, what's up? How you doing? I'm challenging you guys. Now I start to relax and open my heart and start to receive you guys in. Start to relax to my stomach, start to ground, and then I'm like, so tell me more about that. And now I'm receiving you back. Can you guys see that out there in, in uh, YouTube land? So when you're doing it, to get into flow state, the first step is tension, right? I gotta have enough tension. And the tension is the conduit itself. I don't have to push, I just have to have a conduit. So if I wanted to let you in, I have to create a conduit to you. If I'm blown out, no conduit. If I'm just kind of like, whatever, no conduit. If I'm too intense, no conduit, because all the energy is going this direction, right? So that's conduit going in the wrong direction. In that sense. But if I start to relax and just let you in, then I can let you into my heart, let you into my stomach, and I can just start to say what comes up. What's coming up inside of me? It's gonna, for those of you that aren't used to it, it's gonna feel vulnerable. If you're used to it, it'll feel less and less vulnerable. It'll feel more natural. Like this is how we're supposed to connect. It creates a nice connection. I even find myself sometimes, like I'll be sitting there uh, and I'll be wanting to watch TV or I'll be wanting, because there's a TV show on and, and there's my girl and I'm like sitting there talking to her and I can feel me not connecting to her because I'm like, I'm wanting to watch this TV show and I'm like, uh, and then I shut off the TV show later or something and I just drop in and I go, okay, now I'm just going to talk. Now there's a little resistance and I just start letting go of the resistance and then pretty soon it just starts to happen. And then I'm like, oh, this feels so much better. It's better than even the TV show. Like suddenly I don't care about the TV show. I just want to connect with you. Once I let her in, but up until the point I let her in, I'm like, ah, oh, you know. And we guys have the tendency to do that. Whereas the girls are constantly seeking this, let me in, let me in. They're knocking on the door. Right, trying to get in, and some guys never let them in. They try, 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 and then one day they just shut off on you and go the other direction. They'll try, they'll try really hard, and then they realize it's never gonna happen. Bye. And then you're like, where'd she go? 
And it's because you're not letting her in. Part of her gift is being let in so she can feel you and, and get a feel for you. So you as the masculine are letting her in and reading her and, and, and taking and understanding her and she's letting you in and you're exchanging back and forth. So what the heart walks were about was being able to walk around and noticing how things affect you that are not judging you, not people. Vulnerability walks are about people being judged by other people. So if I walk around as a heart walk, guys, and I look, and let's say I take in the red in this, in this writing and I just let it in, or, how, or the sentences and how they affect me if I let them all the way into my heart or all the way down to my stomach or ground them through my body, or the painting, if I feel that and I let it in, or the unicorn up there that you guys can't see, it's a, it's a blow up unicorn up on top of the refrigerator. <laughs> or, yes. And then uh, unicorns are the best. Yeah. And, you guys know what a unicorn is in a swingers community? Yeah. <laughs> so, that's, the, that's the single girl that goes to the swingers community by herself to look to get laid. She's a unicorn. So again, if I look out there, I see that four-wheel drive truck, and immediately I let it in. It's a, a van, actually. It interests me. And I let it in. It's been out there for days now. I keep noticing it. Or the palm tree flowing, and I let it in. You'll notice all of this has an emotional effect on your body. It might not be big. It might be very subtle. It might be, oh, it just makes me a little more relaxed. That makes me open up. Or watching the palm trees blow in the wind makes me feel good, you know? And, and so learning to let that stuff in and affect you is the beginning of flow state. It's the inch gateway, because now we're playing with tension, and then, the vul and then what flows through the conduit into your body is where the vulnerability happens. And as you do that more and more, so especially in the morning, like when I'd get up and I'd be in my head and I'd start looking at things, trying to let them in, and it'd be difficult. And then suddenly 15 minutes later, boom, something goes in, and you're like, ah, oh, I can breathe now. And you realize how much time you spend in your head. And the faster you can get to this point where the outside world and the inside world are circulating, they're becoming more one with that flow, the better you're going to feel. How, a lot of us walk through the day walled off and we never let the outside world in. And no wonder we're fucking tired. We're not letting energy come up through our legs. We're not letting energy come up through our heads. We're not letting the outside world in. We're in an isolated bubble. You cannot hit flow state. Flow state is required requiring you to let all this energy flow through your body, okay? So we're gonna add more elements to this throughout the weekend. And we're gonna start teaching you how to physically do this because it's gonna activate all these chemicals. Now you're gonna get, a, you're gonna get, there's a bunch of different chemicals you get. I've even heard somebody say there's more, they've isolated more chemicals than I've got on this list now. I haven't double checked that, but this was the original list. I'll just read it, I'm gonna write it down later, but dopamine, endorphins, uh, anandamide, uh, serotonin and oxytocin uh, all when you start to go into flow state start to pump into your body and wouldn't you like all that stuff and running through your body all the time okay now what's a vulnerability walk a vulnerability walks doing the same thing that I'm doing with all the objects in the room maybe I'd watch the fire and let it in just let it affect me the vulnerability walks would be doing that with a person that's looking at me or seeing me or noticing me and feeling vulnerable or, in, or, look, or having people watch me. Anything that makes me feel potentially judged by others and getting comfortable letting other people in, letting them see me, letting their, their potential, my, my projections of their judgments come through my body. Okay, that's why I just wanted to create a difference between the two because it's, it's much, it's, it can be very easy to walk around in nature in a beautiful stream on the beach or something like that and just let everything in. But then you get walk into a, a bar with a bunch of people and they're all looking at you and are you dressed right? Are you in the right crowd? And suddenly you're like, ah, I wanna go run back to the bar, right? We had a client here at the last experience workshop and he had said he'd spent, I don't know how long, out in the woods by himself without seeing another human being to the point where he even said he stopped thinking in words. He was, a, he was he, he, that's what he did. He went deep into the woods and I don't know exactly what he did, but. He said, I started just thinking pictures. I'd picture something and I'd go do it. I'd picture something else and they said, I just stopped using words at a certain point because there was nobody to use words with anymore. And then he said he came back to the physical world and he said it was super intense. All this energy of people. He says, I couldn't, it was hard to be around people. And he said, the first person I saw was this girl that came to a class I was gonna teach. And I walked up and I got out of the car and she jumped out of the car and screamed because she knew me. I was all excited, ran over to hug me. And he said, I literally fell to my knees and I was like, and I literally hit the ground with my knees because it was too much energy coming at me at once. I wasn't, I wasn't used to it. I hadn't seen another human being for months on end, and it overwhelmed me. 
So the vulnerability walks are about letting all that emotion, her craziness, her drama, her feminine, and letting it come through you and then grounding it out like we did with, was it you? Yeah, you earlier. And learning to let it run through our kinetic chain and into the earth and letting the earth come back and feed us. That's where we get a lot of our, our energy comes from the earth and our energy comes from the sky above us. But we also get energy from in front of us as we shift. So, so right now I want to see what it feels like for you guys before you go to lunch to just start letting energy in to your heart. Letting it come in, opening the conduit, letting it in, opening your heart and letting it at least touch your heart. And if you can, to the stomach. You just started doing it, right? How did that feel? Did you feel your body drop? Yeah. Yeah. You did, Sorry. you dropped. That's how I noticed it. I watched you go, boom, down. It was really cool, you're starting to do it. You see, you notice the energy of the room is already starting to change. So what I'm gonna ask you all to do is take a few minutes, walk around a little bit, and just pick different objects, whether they have, and, and notice how they make you feel. Anything that's got any type of energetic intensity to you, open, see if you can, even if you have to take your hands and do this, stretch your heart open and stretch your head open, and feel a sense of letting it come through you. You can go out to the balcony, look outside at nature, you can look out the windows, you can look at the art, but anything, and, and, and you don't have to, if you wanna do a few people, do a few people, but I wanna make it easy on you right now, so pick inanimate objects or, or life, like trees, dogs, birds, things like that. Uh, birds get colors, red, blue, greens, notice how, and you're gonna notice, and I want you to particularly, and all you guys online too, notice how different things affect you differently. Does a different color affect you differently? Does a distance versus close affect you differently? You can look at your own hand and touch it and let it in, and you could look at, do you have a picture on the wall at home of something that really means something to you and, and let it in. You can even let in a memory and notice how it affects you, okay?